Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for joining. And I'm so glad that you, you share the interest in, that has become my passion here over the past year. Um, so I wanted to kind of give you a sense of what this project is. Um, I'll just start by recognizing that our tier pilot project has been generously supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, and what it's supported to do is to really look together with a number of partners uh, across the globe uh, together to better understand and document not only the data flows and the, the uses of open access monograph usage data, but to take that information to then think about how a data trust model could support and impact that work by facilitating economies of scale or reducing the duplication of effort that's going on um, around usage data in scholarly book publishing. So that's what we're here to talk about today. I'll see if I can get my slides so I can actually advance. There we go. Um, before I get started, I wanted to just take a quick footnote that puts us in context um, by flagging that you know the International Science Council General Assembly in October 2021, CODATA is going to make data for cross-domain challenges a decadal program focus. And to paraphrase their statement, I think this is really powerful as J. Rust. They said, you know, we have unprecedented opportunities to maximize the benefits of collaboration by integrating relevant data from disparate disciplinary sources, yet our capacity for such analysis is constrained by the limitations in our ability to access and combine heterogeneous data within across domains. And to be effective, we must consider ecosystems with maximally automated stewardship of data, effective terminologies, and metadata specifications. And I just want to pause and think about that because this co-data focus really signals that we're not alone in thinking about the ways we work together and align across siloed data. This issue is at the heart of emerging data collaboratives and data trust models. And we'll be thinking this hour about one type of scholarly output, open access book and usage data tied to that. But I, I do think this is an area where the JRUS community and the funders who are working with us have that opportunity to foster alignment among the different types of global scholarly data collaboratives that are emerging. Um, we heard about the National COVID Cohort Collaborative early, and we've heard about Open Air, which I think are two other similar models. Um, over this next hour, we're just going to be talking about open access monographs, but I think that's something worth keeping in the back of our mind. So when I'm talking about open access monographs, what am I thinking of? Um, today and the next hour, we're going to talk through four different things. First, we're going to put open access monograph usage data in context. And what are we talking about when we're thinking about impact and usage data? Second piece then will be thinking about what a data trust collaborative really means, what that's meant to do when you overlay that with all the usage data. Um, and to understand who would be involved in a trust, it's really important to think about the, the players at the table and what that data flow looks like and who does it touch. So we're going to talk a bit about those data flows really from a perspective of the stakeholders that interact with the usage data prior to then thinking about for some of those folks, specifically university presses and um, publishing platforms and services, look at how they're using the usage data to then come back to this question of what is the role for a data trust. Now I have the chat open in the bottom of my screen. I should also note that this session is being recorded. So feel free if you have questions as we go to note something in the chat because there's four of us, we can also make this a dialogue. So I'm happy to kind of stop as I go and answer questions if you have them. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in to think about impact and usage. Well, what am I talking about when I'm talking about monograph usage data or ebook usage data? So often I find that when I start these conversations with folks, they're thinking of counts, counts of downloads, counts of citations, how many people accessed a title on a given publisher's website or across multiple platforms. Um, the question though really is how can you collate or aggregate this information when things like chapter counts and book counts aren't necessarily measured consistently? How do you handle situations where standard, in this case the counter compliant reports, aren't consistently available across the platforms where people access those ebooks? Um, what if there isn't a clean way to track what happens when titles become OA or you know, don't have their OA status anymore? When the current workaround to do that is going into a sales system and marking a book with a $0 purchase price. Um, 
sometimes that even results in multiple DOIs, which I recognize there's kind of a joke almost in there that the whole purpose of a DOI is to not have multiple DOIs, but that's a problem. And these issues for both individual titles and chapter level information, um, they're not easy ones to solve. Yet, if an author or publisher wants to understand the global usage activity for their book and tell me the story about my book, they have to combine this information across platforms and navigate these exact nuances to begin to understand how to compare apples to oranges so that they have the information they need for their internal open access advocacy and their internal decision making. So since 2015, Scholarly Communication Institute meeting, our project leadership has been talking with publishers, platforms, libraries, and presses to understand the challenges to this cross-platform usage reporting. In a series of workshops in 2018 and 2019, um, we were able to document in the Book Industry Study Group's white paper, 2019, Exploring Open Access Ebook Usage. Uh, we documented all these findings about what these stakeholders were looking for. And the scholarly communication stakeholders expressed that they wanted to not only understand the reach and usage of their open access monographs, they wanted to leverage that information to make data-driven decisions about their open access investments, as well as their products and services. And the conversation started with the challenges that faced usage counting as we started this conversation just a moment ago, um, and altmetric reporting, but it grew into these desires to leverage that usage data to benchmark open access versus non-access books, um, to think of, you know, are there comps and what does that mean for other decisions or in editorial process, in the acquisitions process, um, to understand performance and reach of different modes of discovery and even to inform then those investments in open infrastructure. So, you know, yet the challenge is confronting this data driven decision making. It, these things can't be resolved by any one player working in isolation. In fact, there are many such groups working through these issues right now. Um, compared to journals, open access books flow through a wider number of publishers and platforms and service providers. And we'll look at that in a moment. And it results in these multiple data sources, which are diverse. And they're sometimes seen as valuable or sensitive information because this information about how a particular platform is used to access books. Um, you know, that could be seen as valuable or sensitive given how many of these players are competing for authors, competing for readers, um, and sometimes competing for their members or their funding. And this makes it challenging to frame an institution's raw usage data as an open resource that needs to be publicly accessible via open data commons. However, I'm going to have us think back to our keynote on Tuesday with the COVID um, cohort presentation. You know, what if there was a way to bring together public and private data with security and privacy controls so that we could view aggregate benchmarking data across the ecosystem in a way that protects those institutional interests while also generating a public good by looking across the information. So I want to kind of keep the COVID clinical trial patient data comments in the back of our mind and what that coalition was trying to do. And in this case, just note that our project is asking whether we can use a similar trusted framework of public and private partnerships with strong data governance and privacy controls to understand the story of an open books impact across discovery channels and in the context of other linked data. Um, and I'll note that while there are valid concerns around surveillance and potential negative impacts at looking at individual level usage data, um, much like they were able to protect the privacy of the COVID study participants, we should be able to wield technical and policy mechanisms to ensure that a data collaborative, in this case, the data trust, can steward its aggregated usage data in an ethical way that abides by community standards and protects privacy. So the key will be bringing together the community to act collectively and make those decisions around governance and, and data stewardship. So in sum, open access ebook usage data is available today from a blend of commercial nonprofit APIs, metric services, institutional silos. And to achieve the value from integrating, linking, and ultimately understanding data from across sources, one must do a hefty amount of what I like to call data wrangling. I used to live in Texas, so I keep picturing all of the folks wrangling cattle or um, sometimes wrangling cats. But in this world, you know, this process of data curation, data linking, data cleaning requires technical staffing 
um, data analysts, uh, resources that small presses, independent publishers may not have access to. And this means that some within our open access ecosystem cannot easily understand the holistic impacts of their open access book publishing efforts and investments. It also means that there is likely duplication within the research enterprise as those data scientists, technical teams go through similar steps in each institution to put their own organizational data in context. So if each press publisher library metric service publishing platform generates that data to contribute to the story of the book's impact, um, and they're each going through these same motions of trying to combine the data sources to put their own institutional data in context, I would suggest that this might present an opportunity, which is exactly where I think the data trust comes in. So with that, what's a data trust? So data trusts, as I've noted before, we've heard some models already, they're known as data collaboratives or data institutions that are emerging as a way for public and private partners to govern data access and aggregate information across while facilitating the data stewardship and reporting across those to control data sets. Um, the trust concept actually comes from the legal trust world where you have individual trustees um, and each of those trustees has the ability to manage the access rights, security and privacy controls for their own information within the trust. However, that also allows them to create shared frameworks and shared data oriented outputs um, that benefit all of the participating parties. And the goal here about thinking about a data trust with respect to usage data and specifically open access book usage data um, you know, I'm gonna paraphrase here two of our co-PIs, Cameron Neal and Lucy Montgomery, who I think many of you know. Um, the hope is that by working together through a data trust, participants can gain access to comparative analytics and those economies of scale while also addressing the resource challenges within organizations um, for those organizations that have less technical capacity. That's the vision. And so how our project is going to get there um, we're a two-year grant, and the grant aims to do a couple things. First thing is to reach out and engage the, the global community of folks who are thinking about open access usage data to really understand what the landscape looks like and how a data trust can fit in. And that understanding comes in a couple forms, some of which we're going to present here since we're about halfway through our grant. Um, one was understanding the data flows or what we call the, the data supply chain, both from a metadata distribution side, but also from the usage data side. The second piece of that was to get a better understanding of the use cases for each of these stakeholders. And use cases can mean a couple of different things, but in this context, what we're going to talk about today are the exact uses of the usage data. Um, taking a design thinking approach, talking to what the funders were mentioning yesterday and how it can be helpful to know what needs you're filling. And so we wanted to start with how are people using the usage data and where are the pain points to then understand how a data trust can fulfill some of those needs and address some of those issues. Um, and so that's what we are working on. We have some things to show, which we'll talk about here because we're halfway through. Um, the other piece of this project then is to extend some of the open source code working from the, the Hermes code that's come out of Europe to start seeing if we can extend that to build out the open source infrastructure that would sustain a data trust and accomplish some of the things that we're talking about. Um, and in the meantime, next year, once we have a sense of what we're trying to do and how we could potentially do it, we're gonna shift, with, um, shift into community conversations to really understand what might be feasible in terms of sustainability, governance, and policy models um, to take this to another phase. I do need to recognize the broader community that I'm working with. I'm here representing a wonderful set of experts. I feel incredibly humbled all the time. Um, we have 26 advisors and principal investigators that span five continents. And we're in conversation with representatives of both Project Counter, um, BISG manages the Onyx standard, as well as European efforts like OAPEN and OPRAS and COPIM and Open Air and Projects Muse and Tome here in the US, as well as Crossref. All of these folks were very lucky to be in conversation with and to have participating um, in this project to give us their guidance. So this really is a kind of system level um, consideration of how we can make things easier. Now, our collaborative effort wanted to you know, recognize that 26 is still a very small number when we think of all of the different stakeholders and perspectives involved in open access usage data. 
Um, and so one of the things we've done to open the door to more conversation and increase stakeholder engagement is we brought online these stakeholder discussion groups, which really allow for kind of low traffic peer to peer conversations um, about those open access ebook usage uh, use cases this year and next year, but then also allowing us to understand from these specific viewpoints how they might perceive and want to see the policy governance and sustainability um, evolve over time. And so this so is a good note that if what I've been talking about so far speaks to you and is of interest to you and you'd like to be engaged, um, know that this is an open invitation to you and, and any of your colleagues. And the link is at the top. Uh, right now we have over 100 people, actually, sorry, we're approaching 100, we're at 96 that have opted into the groups. Um, and we're looking forward to continuing that conversation with folks over the year to come. And so you've heard a bit about our project uh, and you know, now some of the problems around open access monograph usage data. And so now I want to dive deep into the results of the supply chain modeling, the data flows, if you will, um, to get a sense of the complexity there. And so as I mentioned at the onset, one of the outputs of our project was to document those data supply chains. Um, and both for the distribution and the usage data that is related to open access books for the different types of stakeholders across the field. And Michael Clark and Laura Ritchie of the firm Clark and Esposito were contracted to conduct this research or project. And you see the report on the left, as well as an excerpt of one of the workflows. I'm a visual person, so I love these spaghetti mats, if you will. Um, and what you see here in this particular map is the metadata flows um, around the distribution of the books uh, and the various data transfers involved across commercial and scholarly publishing, library management systems, and discovery systems, among others that you see on here, those kind of interface endpoints for the readers as well. Um, and the report itself summarizes the nature of each of the stakeholders and how they work with the usage data um, today. And one thing I want to note with this map, and one of the things I think that is really helpful, is that it takes you from the creation of the monograph on the left through to the access by the reader on the right, and the different steps that, um, and the different data and how it flows through that. You'll note that the standards really do flow from the uh, stakeholder type. So for example, Onyx feeds, as you know, for those of you who may not know, are standard used by publishers. And those are represented here in green. In addition, we have publishing platforms, aggregators, OA repositories that transfer data. Um, and those standard, they're transferring data with multiple standards. So you have MARC for the library management systems, KBART for the knowledge bases, um, and Onyx again for those library sales management systems. And what I really like about this graph as we think about the distribution of the monographs is the lack of standards that are represented here in these solid black lines. These are places where we see innovation. These are places where there may not be a standard yet today, um, but it just shows that even though we do have a number of standards, there's still a lot of information around the edges where it isn't standardized that requires data wrangling, to use that type of phrase again. So now I'm going to shift our attention to book distribution data, um, from book distribution data to the usage reporting. And here we have the exact same stakeholders, but they have different roles and different data flows. And on this one, you have dotted lines um, of usage engagement data flow that go from the right where the reader interfaces with the information um, into, you know, towards the left where at the end of the day you need reporting. And you'll note that all of these go through in the middle the aggregators, the platforms, and the repositories. And it's the solid lines that represent the packaging and provision of usage reports by these services and repositories back to the distributors, the librarians, the publishers, and ultimately back up to the authors and funders. And so at the end point of each of those set of lines, you see that the publishers, the librarians, um, they have the brunt of the data wrangling to provide that reporting and those dashboards for the authors and, and for their funders and institutions. It's within this context that I think we need to consider how a data trust might make, uh, might achieve economies of scale. You know, might we be able to help those managing the multiple streams for reporting through a shared data trust? 
based on open source infrastructure. And to answer that, this is where I think we need to get into that better understanding of what each of those stakeholders need, which bring us to the use cases. And I'll just note that, you know, instead of jumping right into building the infrastructure, one of the things that was lucky, I know when I joined the team, I brought design thinking expertise, and we wanted to take that step back to explore where the stakeholders had pain points um, and to make it really a community dialogue to surface what the different activities are around usage data. And the thinking is that if we start with what the needs are, how people are using that usage data, then we can better understand how a data trust fits within the complex picture we just saw. And so going through design thinking, we you know, wanted to start with a couple things. We wanted to get an understanding of the personas, who works with this information in an organization. Um, I wanted to do this by stakeholder by stakeholder. We're gonna look just at how university presses answer this in a moment. But the first thing is who at your organization is working with usage data. And then we went from that to understanding the specific activities that is undertaken by those different roles. Um, you know, often people say, okay, well, we just do reporting or we report on impact or track impact. Well, what does that mean? So we go through a number of iteration, both exercises online, in addition to meetings, to flush some of that out and then, you know, <laughs> document it at the end of the day. And we actually have these open for public comment as they're approved by the group. Our university press group is the first one to go through that. And what you see here on the right uh, is an example of what's right now open. Um, as you might expect, this is a time consuming, iterative, collaborative process. And uh, we had to figure out how to do it, not in an in-person session, but online. And so it did slow us down a bit, but it allowed us to also engage people asynchronously across time zones, um, which I think was really useful. So at this time, uh, given all that slowdown, we have two groups that are kind of towards the end of that process and number of others that are in the middle of it or will begin in earnest in 2021. And today we're going to talk about the two that have kind of most gone through that process. So the university presses and the publishing platforms and services. So starting with the university presses, things that have emerged in that conversation. We'll just start high level with the challenges. You see here that um, given uh, that as a publisher, all those lines that we just saw going in, you know, really they see those challenges and have frustrations around the metric and reporting, the resource that it takes to do that. Um, and some of the issues about the data coming in. So it's inconsistent usage data. They're not really always sure of what the different sources are because of the nature of the dissemination of open access books. Um, the demand and time and technical expertise to do the data wrangling, if you will, was something that we heard quite commonly. And then also um, figure out how to ban it, how to balance the use of that information for internal purposes within the press, but also externally um, providing reporting as folks demand, as the authors need it, as their institution for funding reports need it. Um, so balancing that was another piece of challenge from the university press side. And when we thought about where the data trust could fit in, some of the things we heard from that community was that, you know, help informing the standards, turning some of those solid black lines on that first map to a colored line could be useful. Um, helping to facilitate and ease the reporting visualization process, as well as facilitating and easing that um, data access and aggregation across the data sources and the, the different types of linked data that they were looking to. Um, as far as the activities that came out, there were quite a few that came from not only the operations of the press, but the reporting side. Um, and then I would also say the advocacy side, understanding what the impact of open access is and what the impact of funding tied to open access is. These are all themes that came out. And we're gonna talk about this in a moment, but as I enter that, I think it, for those of you on this call, it might be helpful to think how, you know, your own service, your own repository, if you go through these, open question for us is how much of the other press um, publisher types, so do commercial publishers, library publishers, and society presses have the same needs as the university presses and where they differ, where are those points of difference? So I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly because we're gonna be sharing our slides at the end, um, but I'll just walk through a couple of the high level um, components for each of the university presses and how they're using this information. Before I get started, are there any questions? Sorry, I'm taking a quick cup of, a quick sip of coffee while I'm asking. 
Anyone? This is probably a question I, I should have asked a little sooner, but yeah, uh, the the ebook or the open access ebook space is a little new to me. Um, in terms of, I guess I didn't realize it was such a big space. Uh, in terms of how many people are publishing and generating these types of books, um, are they authors at universities or? maybe could you speak to the to, absolutely to kind of who who are writing these books and um absolutely funding these books yeah and yep. even what kind of topics maybe you bet it's um it's very disciplinary focused and primarily the authors this is something that we see in the humanities and social sciences um where the book and the monograph is first and foremost kind of the the object of scholarly output as opposed to a journal or data set. And so I think that in many ways that we've seen a lot of advances on the journal side and the data side for the sciences, um, the humanities and social sciences, because I've been working in books and there's this been the transition to digital humanities, the transition to those digital outputs, um, this is really in some ways tied to those disciplines. Um, but that isn't to say that there aren't ebooks tied to the sciences as well. And so you often see those, you know, think of trade books um, through the societies, through, you know, IEEE is a great example, where they have books that may be commissioned um, by authors at the universities. And so all of this information, people want to know, well, if we make it open access, then what? And so I think that, you know, the university presses that we were just talking about, um, many of these open access programs do have an innate focus on the humanities and social sciences um, because of that's where the nature of most of the attention as a scholarly output is. However, that doesn't mean that we don't have um, books and monographs coming out of the sciences. Does that help a bit? Thanks, yeah, that, that really helps and that makes sense. And I'm on the science side, but I know the humanities and, and books are more of a, a model of scholarly discourse. So that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, thanks so much. For sure. And, and I'll also note that I think the other area of overlap, while it's not an express focus of our project, just because we could very quickly outgrow the scope of what we're trying to do, um, we are very, uh, very intentionally looking at this narrow um, piece of open access monographs that are primarily humanities and social science. Um, if you were to overlay books in the context of open educational resources, what does it mean to have an open textbook? That broadens us even farther. Um, and so I think we, we very intentionally picked a very narrow use case because of how complex it was, recognizing that we could grow over time if there was interest in this panned out. I think this makes a lot of sense. So with that, let's kind of jump in a little bit, um, talk about some of these use cases. So uh, from the press perspective, university presses, um, you know, there are operations within universities that generate and publish in-house. And what we heard from them with respect to the usage data and how they use it, a couple different things. One, they wanted to understand audience engagement. Who is reading these books? Where are they? So when I say who, they didn't want to have individual reader information, which I think is very important because there are valid concerns around surveillance, but they want to know the trends. They want to know where these books are being read, um, what types of users are picking up the books, does a certain title or chapter, um, is it picked up more by students, by scholars, is it being used in K-12, is it being referenced by policymakers? Um, so having a sense of who the audience is and also um, trends around the access itself. Is it seasonal? Is it within an institution or a specific region or outside? Um, is it just one chapter cover to cover? What does that mean? Because that can influence marketing and it can influence the marketing of similar books. Um, the other thing that we heard was that the titles themselves could be a path to engagement in other ways. It could be a path to the purchase of print uh, editions. It could be a pathway to acquisition um, by partners who are looking to expand lists. So they wanted to understand the functioning of OA and the function of a specific title within those flows. Again, that was marketing. If we extend that to sales, what we see here is that, again, they wanted to take the information about usage data 
to then consider how to um, influence the spread and dissemination of knowledge. If you see that an open access title is being um, accessed in a particular part of the world, could that inform translations, local editions, um, different strategies of getting that information out there? Um, they also want to understand how open access impacts the sales revenue from the other titles um, that are purchase based. So in those cases, you know, I think a lot of people were concerned if everything's open access, nobody's going to pay for content. And we've heard from a number, uh, a handful at this point that that has not borne out yet. So tracking that and understanding what that means for the revenue coming into presses is something that people wanted to understand. Um, Similarly, being able to guide and make decisions about marketing and sales, given that um, balance between open access usage and print sales is something they wanted to kind of operationalize. With respect to the funding impacts of open access, um, this is where I think we see a lot of reporting come out. So creating those reports for compliance and the inf providing information back up to the funding agencies and foundations around how this content has been accessed and used is something that was really important. But also, as I was just mentioning, those downstream impacts, um, what does it mean to have open access? And this, again, dovetails with that advocacy. What was the impact on the access to knowledge? What's been the impact on the publication side? Um, and how information about open access has actually influenced some of the editorial processes and influenced authors to go away. Um, what is the impact of downstream on students, for example? So thinking about social equity and, and justice. Um, what are those impacts? Are we actually saving money for students who may not have resources? Are we getting information into the hands who, of the people who didn't have it before? Um, and as I mentioned before, what's the impact on gated content? Um, there's some detailed analysis where folks want to understand, well, what does it mean if something is licensed one way or another? Um, that also plays into this. But at a large scale, I think all of these really come back to kind of the trends, right? Um, and so thinking through, you know, what happens when things change, this is where like usage changes. So if the status of a title shifts, what does that mean for usage? Does it include it? Does it not? Um, and these help people tell the story of the impact of open access. Benchmarking. I was reading a lovely story today um, through something from Read 2.0 about the impact of um, comps and how in the book sector, if you're going to decide to publish or not, you look at comparable books and how do they perform. Benchmarking is really important in book publishing. Um, and one of the pieces that we see here within the university presses is how do open access versions compare to their non-open access um, components. Um, so if we took it, they call them comps, right? So if we were to take the open access version, compare it to something on the non-open access version, what does that mean? And you can do these as trends. So maybe not a particular title, but a series. Um, you know, what does it mean for regional impact and use? What does that mean for altmetrics, the, both the quantitative and qualitative impacts? Um, and online engagement at the end of the day. So going back to those policymakers, you know, how does the knowledge flow? Um, and a lot of that comparable analysis is also an interest within the discipline. So if we were taking, you know, book X, what does that mean in, you know, still within the same area of social psychology over here, you know, does one perform better than another based on the subject code, based on a subject taxonomy. With respect to editorial strategy, um, again, this stuff that we saw in sales are kind of part and parcel. How can open access usage inform the print editions or course potential for a certain topic and translating of one type of book to another? This is where we get into OER, um, but also helping to identify lists and series and titles that should become a way based on the performance of other books, um, identifying prospective authors based on usage and thematic areas for acquisition. These are all things that came out as a ways that open access usage data can kind of influence and inform those decisions. Um, we talked about authors and I want to footnote, this is what the university presses have their authors asking of them. We are going to, as a project, have a workshop specifically and directly with authors because we go on to kind of hear it from them. What are they looking for? Um, so recognizing there's a bit of a telephone game here. 
um, the university presses really need two things. One, they needed information to support their education and advocacy for OA with authors. So what are the pros and cons of OA? What have they seen with other authors at the institution and how have they benefited? Um, what's the return on that investment in OA? And where are the potential sources of funding? That's all under that education advocacy piece. Um, but in addition to that, then providing those impact reports so authors then can have an understanding of how the information is used. Um, this is something that we heard a lot about where people really wanted to understand not only the who, what, where, and how that we talked about up front, but also if there's potential other, you know, crossover, potential other audiences. And this interesting, you know, one of the things I always thought was transformative and innovative were people saying, what if our authors not only knew that there were uh, tweets going on and social media engagement with the title, but they knew it real time so that they could engage with their readers. And I think that this is where usage data perhaps can be transformative depending on how people get it and when they get it. And so something to think in the back of our mind about what of this information is useful um, given all the other contexts. I talked about editors. Um, I'll just note that one of the things we heard was that the um, this usage data can really inform editors as they're pursuing specific goals for the work that they're commissioning and acquiring. Um, with respect to fund and grant development, there's, you know, within the universities, of course, there's a lot of proposal development. So having the information about how the open access books are being used to tell those stories of impact and inform partners, again, advocacy and education focused, just in this case, to um, those with money. From an administrative reporting side, similarly, to make the case for institutional support, a lot of that same reporting was necessary. Um, and in some cases, there's also reporting here where P&T and career advancement wants to understand how those books are being used. And I'll flag, there's an open ethical question here that the community needs to work through. What happens if those numbers aren't positive? How do you reflect that? Or how do you manage that? And I recognize that is very much an open question that I think we really do need authors and societies to chime in on um, because I'll come back. But for the sake, you know, continuing on this list, we have advocacy um, reports on impact uh, and the way to advocate for open access as you're working with other university units. That's other places where this data comes in. So all of that has to do with just how university presses as publishers fit into this big map. The other piece that I wanted to walk through here um, was platforms and services. And we started very broadly, we've had um, back and forth conversations as a project, if we should walk through specifically for ebook aggregators, specifically for publishing platforms or for repositories to understand if the use cases, how different they are. Um, so we started together with over 40 <laughs> representatives to see if there was a common use case. And I'm gonna tell you what surfaced from that right now. Um, but for those of you who are running services on this call, I would love to hear your thoughts as at the end of this to see if we should break these out and if they're value. So things we heard from the sessions we had with our platforms and services, um, the challenges because of their role in the middle, all the arrows going to and from, Really, when you think of usage data, the challenges, again, lack of standardized data, um, challenges comparing apples to oranges with the type of usage data coming in. Sometimes it was inflated. If a chapter is downloaded, you know, a whole book, do we count all the chapters too? How do people handle chapter counts versus title counts? Um, what if there are bots doing the downloads? How is that handled consistently? We have counter as a standard for the usage, the counting of this usage data but it's not applied consistently. And it's had some challenges with open access that are addressed in the latest version. Um, but a lot of the organizations still rely on Google Analytics. And so a lot of these platforms and services have to respond up the chain to the authors and institutions. Well, Google's telling me X, what does that mean? How do I fit this all together? Um, and so it's really that not only the data wrangling, but the putting data in context, that is a constant challenge. Um, so when it comes back to what could a data trust do to help, Part of it is on the data visualization side. Is there a way to streamline that? In addition to, you know, hey, is there a way to come up with a common source of clean data? Um, the activity areas, platforms and services, again, broadly recognizing the diversity they're in. 
is both operational and customer service oriented. And you see a lot on that center there of that kind of member customer support. So feeding information back up to the libraries, to the authors, um, to the publishers, so that they can provide the information to the authors and the funders. Um, and so that is where a lot of that dashboard work is, all those lines going to the left. Um, but internally, platforms and services also use this information to inform their own sales, marketing strategies, as well as, you know, with all of the data management, curation and stewardship they have to do in-house as well. And just to highlight in that member support piece, you know, we've already talked through this from the university press perspective, but similarly, the platforms and services are looking at how do we provide those reports and dashboards with the information that's needed to put data into context for those different audiences? Um, and how do we then, you know, and perhaps with a different hat on, as our members and customers are evaluating our platform or service, how can we use that usage information to help tell that case of the impact that we're having as a platform and service? Um, and then there's also an education piece here. If we can get institutions, because remember right now, institutions feed their data in um, the process of having institutions clean up their metadata, provide better metadata so that better reports can come out is something that a lot of these platforms and services struggle with. Marketing strategy for the platform and service. Um, usage data can help inform, uh, understand what's going on with search engine traffic, how to optimize that traffic. Um, and again, for the open infrastructure, to help them provide information to their own funders and stakeholders about what they're doing and how that has an impact on the open access monograph usage. Similarly from sales, um, for platforms and services, this information about usage can drive and inform things, differential pricing, differential product offerings. I had an interesting conversation around the preservation of titles, for example. And if you could use the usage information to then inform preservation levels, um, thinking of the NDSA levels of preservation. So thinking about how we can take the usage information and inform these other conversations is something that many are thinking about. Um, in addition to identifying leads for services, et cetera. As you might expect on the data wrangling side, um, there is quite a lot around supporting that usage data um, and so this is where, you know, we see a con potential, I think, for economies of scale, all of the cleaning and aggregation and management and versioning of the information, um, applying definitions or finding out where they're missing and managing all of the, the data nuance that we talked about earlier is something that each one of these platforms and services is struggling with um, and, and really has to do. And then figure out how to apply each other's APIs across the ecosystem. Um, each of them employing security privacy controls and then also managing that data provenance uh, for the usage data specifically. And so, you know, going from that to developing their own platform and services, you know, they of course want to understand those usage flows. Um, many of the data, those of the data analyst team do have to create those dashboards and visualizations to pass on, create custom reports or APIs to pass on the information. Um, and manage the cookies that collect usage data because they're situated in the middle of that supply chain. They have to support both ends, if you will. And so from a technical development perspective with usage data, they are working both sides of that map. They have to design and develop features, widgets, API, and understand the impacts on usage. Um, and then if things aren't being used, can they decommission them because of usage? And so I think this is an area where, again, we just need to be mindful um, of how technical that is. And so this brings us to the end of the talk, which really is kind of the pause moment, which is how we're entering next year of our project. What does all of this mean for a data trust? And so this is where I kind of wanted to open the door for all of us to think, and I know we only have a couple minutes, um, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. And I had a group map uh, we could use, but we could also just discuss. I'm curious what all of you think, given this information, is there a role for a data trust in this space? And I'm gonna share the link to that group map here in chat if you wanna add any specific thoughts on where you think that role is. I'm also happy to take questions.
Um, thanks, Christine. There was loads in that. Um, it was really interesting. Um, I was curious about a sort of specific thing, I suppose. You mentioned the university presses that you're speaking with. And I wondered, are there any born open access university presses that you're speaking to, or are they all managing um, to sort of levels of access their books? There are some. And, you know, the fully open access press that you're probably most familiar with would be UCL Press. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working with quite a few and we're trying to broaden that out, but we haven't split the use cases yet between mm -hmm. those that are, you know, fully digital, fully OA and, and those that aren't. Um, it might be an interesting thing to split over time. I'm curious, you know, I'm, now I'm really intrigued. I'm like, oh, I wonder if that is different. <laughs> like, but we are working with both. Um, and I'll note something that I didn't talk about in the slides is we're actually working with six specific partners to pilot what some of the data in just workflows and dashboards could be. Uh, and we're lucky that UCL Press is one of those. The others that we're working with are ANU Press, so Australian National University. Um, oh, okay. Wits University Press we're working with, and then University of Michigan as well with Fulcrum. Mm -hmm. And so we're working with those as kind of our university-born presses. Um, we're also working with OAPEN and Springer Nature's open access program as kind of that pilot dashboard piece, if you will. So mm -hmm. we're hoping that adds an additional layer of detail beyond these use cases here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. But wonderful question. Any other questions? Hearing none, I think I have the ability to let everyone get a drink and a break before our next session. <laughs> I just want to say thanks. This is really interesting. Um, and you kind of mentioned other spaces. And um, so for our repository work is a project called Make Data Count, um, which is a standard way of counting uh, really kind of hits the page. So downloads, views, uh, and normalizing, you know, getting rid of bots. Um, so that's just within our project. Uh, but the initiative is broader than that. So it's just interesting to hear kind of other spaces where we're thinking about the metrics. And, and I like how you outlined how people are using the different metrics. I think what's interesting in kind of the research data space is that people aren't really thinking about the metrics yet, like in terms of they're not seeing them as that important yet, but we're thinking of it as being an important part, like having the metrics will then allow people to see the importance of the data. So it's sort of kind of almost the reverse situation that you're in. So it's so yeah, true. It's and really and interesting. even in our project, and, and I think I just benefit because I've done the design thinking work before with other um, in other projects, but I think um, it'll come once people have the data, then they're like, hey, what can we do with it? Um, yeah. This just, I think, helps us to anticipate some of that need a little bit when we flip it. Right. Yeah. No, it's really great. And I love that design thinking approach. So thanks so much. Really, really great Ooh, session. Everybody.